gracious Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for your interest in our lives. We thank you because you love us and you like us. Thank you, Lord, because of this opportunity that is ours to listen to your word. We pray that you will make it plain. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Today we will we'll be going to the book of 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4. The title is My Head, My Head. 2 Kings chapter 4. We begin reading from verse number 8. The Bible says, and it fell on a day. It fell on a day. There is always the start to an activity. Perhaps it began with one glance, one touch, one fondle. Many things usually begin once. The Bible says that Elisha passed Shunem, where was a great woman, and she constrained him to eat bread. And so Elisha, I know there are very many places wherein you can lay your head in Samaria, but I beg you, I implore you, I ask you, please abide with me. She's a kind woman. The Bible says, and so it was, that as often as he passed by, he turned thither to eat bread. So one day over time becomes irregularly. Things beginning once are now done regularly. Things began occurring. Things become, began occasionally, now are done frequently. Elisha passed by one day. Now he begins passing as often as is possible. The Bible says, and she said unto her husband in verse 9, Behold, now I perceive that this is a holy man of God which passeth by us continually. Let us make a little chamber. A little chamber. I pray, let us set a, there a bed, let us also set a stool, let us set a candlestick, and it shall come to pass when he cometh, he shall resort thither. And so... The text comes in the book of Zechariah chapter 4 verse 10. Don't despise the day of small beginnings. She made a little chamber. And we have reiterated it from this particular pulpit that, you know what? You must be not so careful about the big to the extent that you forget the seemingly insignificant and small things. Christianity is about small things. You read about it in the book of Luke, it will tell you that he who is faithful in little will be faithful also in much. We have talked about it this past week, Proverbs chapter 6 verse 10, a little sleep, a little slumber, poverty attacks you. And so many usually look at the little faults of others. And they excuse this, the, 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 they look at the supposedly big flaws of others while they look at their supposedly insignificant little sins. They are adulterers, we are not. They, are, they steal, we do not. But we forget that when we do the very little things which offend God, James chapter 2 verse 10 will tell you, whosoever offends in one point is guilty of all. And so be, always begins with thoughts, little things, eventually morph into habits, and then character finally, your character determines where you will have your show of life at the end of it. 
Small sins will cause you to miss a very big heaven. And so she makes a little chamber for Elisha. And because she makes a little chamber for Elisha, she in turn makes room for Elisha's God. And does Elisha still pass today? Elisha is a type of Christ. In fact, similar names, um, similar meaning in the names. Jesus still passes by today. The song asks, crowded is your heart with care. Have you no room for Jesus? Captured by earth's guilds and its snares, have you no room for Jesus? Lo, he is standing at your door, knocking and knocking, oh and oh. Hear him pleading over and over again, have you no room for Jesus? She makes room for Elisha and Elisha's God. And God begins coming to her and asks, ah, hey, by the way, what do you want us to do for you? That's verse 13. You've been very careful to us. Do you want us to speak a word for the king on your behalf? Or do you want us to talk to the captain of the host? You see, Elisha is connected. Elisha knows people. And she answered, I dwell among my own people. And so she says, I am content. I essentially in need, I am essentially in need of nothing. Content with her circumstances. I'm not asking for any favors. Perfect contentment with her lot. Verse 14, and he said, what is to be done for her? Gehazi answers, verily, she hath no child and her husband is old. So Gehazi reveals a hidden need. And the text in the book of Romans will tell me that sometimes we even don't know how to pray as we ought to. But the Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. And so she, have, she had a hidden need. Her lip was closed but indeed her mouth was full. It may be your situation this evening. The title still remains, My Head, My Head. And so Elisha summoned her. She came. She stands at the door. And uh, verse 16, the Bible says this. Elisha says, About this season, according to the time of life, you shall embrace a son. And she said, Nay, my Lord, don't tease me, man of God. Don't lie to your handmaid. Don't tease me. Don't lie to your handmaid. And so she is in doubt. Perhaps because over the years she has come to accept her lot, you know, childless. That's how I'm going to be. Nothing, nothing will come out of this womb. And the Bible says this in verse number 17. And the woman conceived and bore a son that season that Elisha had said unto her according to the time of life. And so the text comes to us telling us, hey, God's purposes, no, no haste or delay. Like the Vast, like the stars in the vast circuit of the appointed paths, God's purposes, no, no haste or delay. If he said he's going to do it, he shall do it. If he promised it, he shall honor it. In fact, he says, the honor of my throne is staked at my word. And so the answer comes. And so we plead with you and we exhort one with another saying, hey, wait for it. You've been praying for it for, for so long a time, but it seems that it is all silent. But my friend, wait for it. The answer will come at that particular point that will best suit your need. The song says, don't. 
Don't, the song says, hold on to God's unchanging hands. And so while you wait, don't change your altar. While you wait, don't change your God. Hold on to his hands. And by the way, whose hands are you holding? Many people are in many people's hands. By the way, it could be that the hands that are holding you are just about to expire. So you best ask, hey, you're holding my hand. When is your expiry date? And so you must be very, very careful whose hands you are in. The Bible tells me even foolish David, when he, count, when he made the mistake of counting the chariots and God visited with him with three options. Hey, David, choose between these three things. Either I send famine your way, either I send enemies after you, or you fall into my hands. David weighed and said, hey, it is better in, even to fall into the hands of God because God is a merciful God. And so the question is, whose hands are holding you? I pray it is that hand of omnipotence. Why? The arm of flesh will flail you. I pray it is that hand of omnipotence because the text says that he will hold you. He will uphold you by the righteous right arm of his salvation. Which hand is holding you? In whose hands are you? And so the Bible says she conceived. She bore a son. The young man grows up. You know, he becomes a very fine lad. The thoughts of the mother, hey, this young man is going to become a prophet perhaps one day. He's going to become a very brilliant engineer or doctor. He is going to be someone dependable, someone who will be useful in church, in society, in his home, in his family. Because he grows up to become a young man, youth time, that particular time of decision making, that particular time that is dangerous, that vulnerable time of accountability and responsibility. And the Bible says when he was grown, it fell on a day. That word again. That he went out to his father, the reapers. And so he decides to exit home, far away from the presence of mother. And the Bible says in verse number 19, And he said unto his father, My head, my head. My head, my head. When he was near mom, the boy was okay. Of course, here we are talking about proximity to God's presence. Proximity even to his church. The Bible says that so long as this particular man was within the vicinity wherein prayer is often made, he was okay. When he was around in Vespas, when he was tuning in on Wednesday and Friday and even on Saturday and all other days, everything was okay. It is when he stepped out that he cried, my head, my head. And so he was all right until he stepped out. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 13 verse 38, what is this particular field? The text will tell you that the field is the world. And so we can say that this particular young man, discontent with the tightness of church, discontent with perhaps the long drawn out and sometimes boring sessions in here said, hey, let me seek freedom from restraint. He stepped out. And he went to the field, he went to the reapers, and when he went there, that's when disaster struck. He began crying, my head, my head. Let me tell us this particular evening that when God created man, he created him perfect. That when he came forth from the hand of his maker, he was in full health. No debasing lusts controlling him. No inordinate desires, I mean, I mean uh, holding him in subjection. But when he disobeyed, 
When he chose to walk away from God, the Bible would tell you that he, 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 he formed a particular nature which, which was fallen. And so today what we see in the world today is a consequence of that fall. Violence, war, rape, immorality, talk about everything. You just need to look into, you know, switch on the news and you'll be able to realize that, hey, the world is crying, my head, my head. People, society, everyone, the world is sick. In fact, the Bible will tell you in the book of Isaiah that it is reeling to and fro like a drunkard. God says this in Hosea chapter 4 from verse 1 to verse 3. Listen, my young friends, hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel. For the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. Because there is no truth, no mercy, no knowledge of God in the land by swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing, committing adultery, they break out and blood touches blood. So God says the world is sick and you and I don't need an announcement to tell us that the world indeed is sick. When you hear stories about young men walking into schools and they start shooting people up, up the world is sick. When you hear stories of this particular kind of abuse that is going on in this particular period, even in a pandemic, and men and women unjust in their dealings with other men, the world is sick, my friends. It is a shocking experience. But listen to this, perhaps it will shock you more. All cherished sin is mental disease. All cherished sin is mental disease and represents a disordered mind. If you choose the world rather than Christ, you are insane. If you choose to be lost rather than heaven, something is wrong upstairs. And so perhaps you are crying now, my head, my head. And so the Bible says in verse number 20, when the instruction was given, carry him to his mother. The lad was taken, he was brought to the mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. When the sun is highest, that's when he died. When he should have been living his most constructive life, that's when he died. In the promising years of her life, that's when she meets eternity. You know, when the potential is greatest and sharpest, when you expect it to go out and fulfill your destiny, you die prematurely at noon in your youth. Remember, you stood one time in church and you said, hey, when I go to form one and form two, you know, you spoke confidently and, say, and you had this particular ambition and dream. Hey, I'm going to become a pilot. I'm going to become someone important one day. I'm going to one day stand in legislative councils, but yet the enemy of our souls drew near to you. You entertained him. He started infecting you with this particular virus called sin. He started contaminating you with this particular parasite called pleasure seeking. He brought you to this particular, uh, he, 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 he was also able to blind you with his empty promises, making you swollen with pride. And perhaps he even tried to give you a particular kind of excitement. But we must be able to tell you, our young friends, that sometimes excitement is not peace. That sometimes pleasure does not necessarily mean happiness. You can giggle and laugh and laugh the, the night away but my friends, you can even drown your situation in some deafening music at night or perhaps even the soothing R&Bs they tell us. You can dance the night away, but you know for yourself that when it is all silent, tears rolling down your cheek, down your pillow, and it is only that particular cry that pierces the night, my head, my head, I have no peace. I have no peace. My head, my head. 
And that is the cry of many a young person. Entertaining temptation and sin long enough. Smoking shisha like a chimney, drinking like a fish. But one day, the doctor tells you something and then you begin crying, my head, my head. You entertain him, of course. You even ask for fair to report to his place. But one night you begin crying, my purity, my purity. You continue crying, my education, my education, my life, my life. When that dreaded, dreaded disease comes to you, you begin lifting up your voice and say, my reputation, my reputation. My dreams, my dreams, my life, my life, my health, my health, everything has come down. My marriage, my, mar my marriage, someone cries this particular evening. It is all the cry of my head, my head. Listen to this. This is volume two of the testimonies for the church, page 347. The brain nerves which communicate with the entire system are the only medium through which heaven can communicate to man and affect his inmost life. But my friend, God does not, God, God has chosen a way through which he can communicate to man. And he says, hey, I have given you a brain and that brain must be clear in order for you to hear my voice. And so he says, if you think that, you will become that. If you think like a fool, you will act like one. If you think cheap thoughts, you will become cheap. The proverb, the preacher says in the book of Proverbs, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And so God needs a clear head. God needs singular thoughts. You know, you cannot be a dual sim Christian. You cannot choose. You know, the Bible says you must choose whom you will serve. You cannot serve God and mammon at the same time. If you are deciding to tune in God into your life, you automatically tune out the devil. And when you tune the devil in, you automatically tune out God. And so you must choose for yourself. You must choose for yourself. Listen to this. It is not the work of good angels to control the minds of men against their will. God has given you that gift of choice. He can't control it. If you yield to the enemy and make no effort to resist him, then the angels of God can do but little than hold in check the hosts of Satan that they shall not destroy until further light shall be given to those in peril to move them to arouse and look to heaven for help. And so God can only do so much. By his grace, he can stay away the hosts of darkness, perchance light arresting you and capturing you, choosing rather not to die but to live. And so the candid introspection of many a young man's life, screaming in peaceless torment at night, there is a storm in their breast. Nothing will allow them rest. The Bible says in Isaiah that there is no rest to the wicked, said the Lord. And so verse number 21, the Bible continues on to say, And she went up, this, this, this woman, lays the child on the bed of the man of God, and shuts the door upon him, and went out, called to her husband, sent said to, to him, send me one of the young men and also one of the donkeys that I may run to the man of God. Oh, what parents of faith are needed in this day and age. When our young people are dead in trespass and sin, when they are pursuing the course of this particular world, away from the commonwealth of God's grace, trying to make it out there with, without God. This particular woman realizing that her son was dead, did not arrange for a particular someone to come at night to perform some particular rituals in the house. No, 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 no. The Bible says she laid the son on the bed of the man of God. She decided, hey, I'm not going to have any funerals in my house. I'm not going to... 
allow myself to sink into this particular uh, state of despondency. Why? There is a particular man of God who gave me this promise. I must seek him out. And so she is a woman of faith. She begins going on toward the man of God. She calls for the servant. She calls for the donkeys. She makes arrangements for everything. A woman of faith. This particular faith which we speak about. I don't have to time to tell you about it. But let me encourage us, my young friends. We may have friends. We may have brothers, we may have sisters, parents, you may have sons and daughters, people whom you care about, but as you look at their lives right now, only discouragement reports to your heart and mind. They are far away from God. You cry and weep, but weep not for long, my friend. Only weep as you weep for them in prayer. The Bible says, indeed, there are many a people who are dead in trespass and sin. Having their conversation in the ways of the world, fulfilling the lusts of the world and its desires. But my friend, there is a balm in Gilead. There is a physician there. There is a man who can quicken the dead spiritual nature. And so she sets off on her journey, going to meet the man of God. And the Bible says in verse number 23 that the response came from the husband. Why will you go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. And she said, it shall be well. And so embarking on your journey to meet Jesus, allow no one to find opportunity to detract you or to delay you. The Bible continues on to say, that she saddled the ass, said to her husband, drive to her servant, drive and go forward. Slack not your riding, except, except I bid thee. So no excuses, no convenient time. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. So you must be resolute. The Bible says, she said, drive and do not stop until I tell you to do so. And so young men, young women, when you decide to begin coming to Jesus, when you decide to follow after him, the resolute purpose in your heart should be, my heart is fixed, my heart is fixed, I have fixed my mind. I have set my course on the narrow way, and there I mean to stand. Verse number 25, the Bible says, so she went. And came to the man of God to Mount Carmel. And it came to pass, as it always does in scripture, when the man of God saw her afar off, that she said to Gehazi his servant, Behold, yonder is the Shunammite. Far above the distractions of the world, God still sits enthroned. And out of his calm eternity, he orders that which his providence sees best. I thank God we do not serve a God who is surprised by the things that happen in this particular world. You know, there are some gods you must inform them that things are happening in your life. You must begin telling them, hey, you know I moved houses. Hey, you know particular things happened. But I thank God the Bible says when the woman was going to God, God said, hey, I am seeing you, I see you. You remember when Zacchaeus thought that, hey, I have climbed up a sycamore tree in order to find this man, Jesus. The Bible will tell you that when Jesus rested or when Jesus stopped at the sycamore tree, he looked up. I thank God he looks up. I thank God he looks down. I thank God that my, my God is not surprised and alarmed. You know, Anyway, we don't have time for that, my friends. The Bible says in verse number 26, run now the instruction is given to Gehazi. Go meet her, ask her, is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with a child? And she answered, it is well. To the faithless, unbelieving world, my young friend, when they tell you it is impossible to live right, answer it is well. 
When they tell you, hey, the word of God is boring, tell them it is well. I rejoice at your, at your word as one who has found great spoil. When they tell you, you know what, you need A, B, C, D, and E in order to succeed. In order for you to be successful, you must, have, uh, you must first of all begin cutting corners. My friends, ask, tell them it is well. You know, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 8 that because sentence, uh, because sentence over an evil work is not executed speedily, then the hearts of the sons of men is waxed even bolder in evil. But the preacher finishes by saying, yet I know it shall be well with them that fear him. It shall be well. And so the response to Gehazi is, it is well. She has no time for Gehazi. You know, the man of God is my concern. She wants him. She has, she has no time. Her grief was not the grief to speak to in different years. She moves to Elisha. Because, my friends, there is only one friend who sticks closer than a brother. When you're spiritually dead, young man, young lady, when guilt darkens your life, when habits have become your master and, you, and they have made you a slave, when your own conscience condemns you, when you kneel to pray, but those particular thoughts come toward you, when society kicks you out like an empty bottle, worthless, there is only one friend, my friends. And the Bible says in verse number 27, she comes to the man of God and she catches him by the feet. The song says there is a place of quiet rest, a place that sin cannot molest, a place of comfort sweet, a place of full release near to the heart of God. The Bible says... Gehazi is given instructions, you know, she wants, to, she wants to get or remove this particular woman from, Geha from Elisha's feet. But Elisha bids the Gehazi to stop and she begins speaking to Elisha. Then she said, did I not desire a son of my Lord? Did I not say deceive me? Sounds like a woman who has a speaking acquaintance with God. They tell me prayer is the opening up of your heart to God as to a friend. And they tell me that if you find voice and time to pray, God will find time and voice to answer. And so the Bible says, Gehazi is given instructions, go, go ahead of us. And lay your staff upon the face of the child. And the mother of the child said this in verse number 30. As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And he arose and followed her. The resoluteness of this particular woman. She says, I'm not leaving you, man of God, Elisha. I am not. And so the young man in 2020 says, I must have the Savior with me, for I dare not walk alone. I must feel his presence near me and his arms round me thrown. It is only then and only then that my soul shall fear no ill. I must have him on the onward march of life. I must have him in the sunshine. I must have him in the rain. It is only then and only then that my soul will fear no ill. And I thank God when, it is, when, we, when, when we purpose, as she did purpose, the Bible says Elisha arose and the woman followed after her. Jesus begins walking as we follow after him. Verse number 31 as we close. Gehazi passed before, passes before them, places the staff on top of the face of the child. There is neither voice nor hearing. She returns with the message, the child is not awakened. Verse number 32, enter Elisha. Enter Jesus. Comes into the house. The situation is still the same. The child is dead. Laid upon his bed. He comes in. And the Bible says in verse number 33. 
shuts the door upon them twain and prayed unto God. Shuts the door. You know, my friend, it is this particular time that we begin calling a decision for, from you. And when we are calling this particular decision from you, we are inviting you to be shut in with Elisha's presence. With the presence of Jesus Christ. Because my friends, they tell me there are two things which we do alone. Number one, we die alone. Number two, we believe alone. And so Elisha says, Jesus says, when it comes to that particular point of decision making, it is only but me and you. Every other voice must be hushed. You must be able to listen to my voice. The Bible says, Elisha comes in, in verse number 30, 34, goes up and lays upon the child, puts his mouth upon his mouth, his eyes upon his eyes, his hands upon his hands. He stretches himself up on, upon the face of the child and the Bible says the flesh of the child works to him. My friends, here we see Jesus being made lower a little perhaps than the angels. Taking upon himself not the form of angels but taking upon himself the form of the seed of Abraham. You see... We thank God for technology that allows us to distract and intrude into your very space. Very great leaps of technology have, have happened, but the greatest leap of technology, my friends, is when God crowded himself into a body that was fitted to die. Taking himself, taking upon himself the nature of man. And this, is, this text tells us what happens when Jesus is near the youth. When he begins communicating through their mouth. When he begins touching them with his hands. When he begins laying his life upon them. The Bible here tells me, hey, this particular man, Elisha, was communicating life to this young man who was dead in trespass and sin. And the Bible says, the flesh of the child works to him. Verse number 35, he returns he walks to and fro, goes up, stretches himself up again. And the Bible says the child sneezed seven times, opened up his eyes. Gehazi was called. The woman was called. The response was given, behold, take up your son. My friends, a day of mourning. That particular darkness at noon now has become, is cheered by light at evening. A man who had been lost now is found. You see, every particular miracle that Jesus ever did. You remember he walked from village to village. People saw the crippled walk. People who were deaf heard. You know, he even stopped funeral trains. He bid, up, he bid men, rise up, take up your bed and walk. He called a particular daughter who, had, who was asleep in death. Rise, your master calls you. Every miracle that he ever did was a demonstration that he can reach that which physicians cannot reach. He can reach your heart. And so he bids you hear his voice. Every miracle. You see, there are very many things that the world will give us. Education. We can even begin exercising our wills. Of course, all these things have their proper sphere. But can the Ethiopian change his skin? Can they who are accustomed to do evil do good? Nay, my friends. In order for the soul to be attracted heavenward, there must be a power that will work in his heart. And that power alone is Jesus. And so we invite you to make this particular decision. That you will invite him into your hearts. The song says we must give up everything. We must give him everything. Our broken dreams, our shattered lives, the trauma in our lives, these dark experiences that taunt and we carry them as heavy burdens. He says, come unto me. Come unto me, I will give you rest. The young man was resurrected. The text says he stood over the rent grave of Lazarus and said, I am the resurrection and the life. 
Paul would then later comment on this particular thing and say, hey, I want to experience the power of his resurrection. And so Jesus calls you, young man, young woman, from the tomb of sin, relegated and forgotten by people, cast away you, you are alive, but people are speaking to you as if you are history. You are dead from the tomb of sin. You remember that particular morning, Gabriel charged. And when he charged, he rolled that particular stone as one man would cast a pebble, sat on it and said, Jesus, your father calls you. It is the same, same invitation that heaven gives us this particular evening. Young man, young woman, wherever you are, Wherever you are, regardless of the circumstances that face you, regardless of the situations that seem to weigh you down, your father calls you. And my friend, when you hear his voice, the Bible says he spoke and it happened. He commanded and it stood fast. Vitality in his word. He says, young man, I am stretching out my hand. And when you read about my hand, it will, the Bible will tell you that my hand is the hand that interrupts death. My hand is the hand that intervenes. My hand is the hand that delivereth and rescueth. Is there anything too hard for God? There is nothing too hard for God. Let us pray as you contemplate this particular message. Write to us, text us. Someone is willing to pray with you. Our gracious Father in heaven, we thank you because you have been a good God to us. We thank you because you can speak to deadness and deadness can become alive. Lord, we submit ourselves to you. We choose to give up our broken dreams, our shattered lives, our souls that are vexed in sin. Lord, we pray that your righteousness may stand in our place. We plead that you will save us. We plead, dear Lord, that you will speak to us, that we may rise to walk in newness of life. Thank you for responding to us this evening. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs>